Welcome to today's Federalist Society virtual event. Today, March 24th, 2023, we are excited to present a litigation update in the case of Apache Stronghold v. US. My name is Jack Apizi, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. After our speakers have given their remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for any questions you might have. If you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will handle questions as we can towards the end of the program. Thank you all for being with us today. And with that, I'll hand it over to Adam Griffin from our Environmental Law and Property Rights Practice Group Executive Committee, who will be moderating today's program. Thank you all for being with us. Adam, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jack, and thank you to the Federalist Society for hosting and, and to our audience for being here. Um, this case is a really interesting one. Um, it is uh, Apache Stronghold versus the United versus United States. It was uh, heard on banc by the Ninth Circuit this week. It presents an intersection between uh, Native American tribes, uh, free exercise rights, uh, religious liberty, and the government's power to regulate its territories. Uh, in 2014, Congress authorized a land exchange between a resolution copper um, and the United States for a large parcel of land um, so that resolution copper could uh, engage in mining and uh, build a mine uh, because the land contains the third largest copper deposit in the world. Um, there is a sacred site um, to the Apaches, the Apache sacred site of uh, Oak Flat that is on that parcel of land. And if the ex land exchange goes through, Resolution Copper plans to de destroy that um, sacred site and build a mine in its place. Um, the uh, Apache stronghold is arguing that would violate their religious liberty under RIFRA, the Free Exercise Clause, and under a uh, trust theory uh, between the government and the Apache. And then the United States is arguing that it's under its power to regulate the territories that it can uh, engage in this exchange. Here to talk about this interesting case is, um, on behalf of Apache Stronghold, is the Vice President and Senior Counsel for Beckett, uh, Luke Goodrich. Uh, Mr. Goodrich is, uh, represents religious liberty claimants across the country at Beckett. Um, he's also an adjunct professor and the author of Free to Believe, The Battle Over Religious Freedom in America. He's won uh, numerous precedent-setting circuit court decisions in his time at Beckett, as well as worked on a number of path-breaking victories at the Supreme Court, including Little Sisters of the Poor versus Burwell, Burwell versus Hobby Lobby, Holt versus Hobbs, and Hosanna Tabor versus EEOC. Um, he is one of the nation's uh, foremost religious freedom attorneys. And before becoming before joining Beckett, he was an appellate attorney at Winston & Strawn in Washington, D.C., uh, worked was an advisor in human trafficking office at the Department of State, and was a law clerk for Judge Michael W. McConnell on the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Um, thank you, Mr. Goodrich, for being here. On behalf of the United States, um, we have speaking Anthony A.J. Ferrati. Uh, Mr. Ferrati filed an amicus brief on behalf of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry in support of Appellate United States. Uh, Mr. Ferrati has a multifaceted background in the areas of law, public policy, energy, campaigns and elections, and defense over the last 20 years. Uh, recently, he is um, as Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for the Oklahoma Independent Petroleum Association. Um, he has represented that association in various government efforts um, with water, electrical generation, commodity marketing, land matters, and other um, environmental and property rights issues. He's also volunteered as General Counsel and spokesman, spokesman for the Oklahoma Republican Party um, and served in various other governmental capacities, including service uh, for Judge Gary L. Lumpkin at the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals, which is uh, Oklahoma's highest criminal appellate court. Um, thank you, Mr. Ferrati, for being here to discuss uh, the United States position in this case and the Arizona Chamber of Commerce's amicus brief. Um, with that introduction, uh, thank you to our speakers, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Goodrich. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, AJ, for being here. Fascinating case. I will start out just kind of laying out our basic position on behalf of Apache Stronghold. And then since we had the en banc argument two days ago, address kind of four big issues of contention that came up at the oral argument, kind of how those uh, can or should play out. So as Adam mentioned, uh, the facts here are not too complicated. The, the government has planned to 
hand over the central sacred site of Western Apaches, Oak Flat, to a copper mine that plans to completely destroy it, swallow it in a crater so it will be gone forever. And our central claim in the case is based on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, fairly simple statute. Um, it says that the government uh, shall not substantially burden a person's exercise of religion uh, unless the government can show that doing that satisfies strict scrutiny. And so every RIFRA claim has two basic parts. First, the plaintiff has to show the substantial burden on religious exercise. And then second, if they show that, the government has to satisfy strict scrutiny. So our argument here is, is fairly simple. <clears throat> it's based on the plain meaning of the statute, uh, based on precedent interpreting the statute, and based on logic. And our argument is that the term substantial burden, uh, it means when it means that the government is making your religious exercise significantly more costly or difficult. And there's a number of cases that everybody agrees count as a substantial burden. Like if, if the government imposes a fine on you, uh, the, the case of Yoder, where the government fined an Amish family for keeping their child out of public schools, or, or if the government denies a benefit from you, like the case of Sherbert, where uh, the plaintiff lost unemployment compensation because she wouldn't work on the Sabbath. Uh, those types of indirect burdens where the government kind of puts you to a choice between exercising your religion or losing out on a benefit or suffering a fine, everybody agrees that those count as a substantial burden. And our argument is here, the government is doing something far worse. It's not just threatening the Apaches with fines if they you know, trespass at Oak Flat. Uh, it is handing over Oak Flat for physical destruction, swallowing it in a crater. It'll be fenced off. The Apaches will never be able to access it again, and it will end their core religious exercises forever, practices that must take place there and can't take place anywhere else. So this is an obvious substantial burden. And earlier in the case, Judge Gumate on the Ninth Circuit said, this is an obvious substantial burden. And there's a lot of precedent that supports this. <clears throat> there's a lot of prison cases where, you know, in prison, the government isn't necessarily uh, penalizing someone for exercising their religion. It can just uh, use its control over the prison context to prevent someone from engaging their, in their religious practice. Say it, it decides not to bring in kosher meals for an Orthodox Jew. Uh, happens in the military context. You're deployed somewhere. Uh, the government may need to give you access to clergy or access to religious meals in order to make you able to exercise your religion. Uh, also happens in the land use context like zoning where the government has control and you can't build or expand your sanctuary unless the government gives you permission to do so. And so this case by analogy, you know, the government controls the land where the religious exercise needs to take place. And when it manages that religious resource in a way that cuts off your access or destroys it and ends your religious exercise forever, that easily qualifies as a substantial burden. Uh, and there's cases that have found this in the Native American context, a case called Comanche Nation, where the government was gonna build a warehouse on the sacred site. Court said, that's an obvious substantial burden. What does this mean? It doesn't mean we automatically win the case. This is just the first half of the RIFRA claim, just means we get to the second step of the analysis of strict scrutiny. And the question is, can the government show that building the copper mine here is the least restrictive means of furthering a governmental, uh, compelling governmental interest? Here, however, the government has not made any argument on the second half of RIFRA. It's placed all its eggs in the substantial burden basket, uh, at least at the preliminary injunction stage. And so that's the only question here is, does destroying a sacred site constitute a substantial burden? Uh, so that's our basic case. There are four kind of areas where oral argument tended to center. Uh, first is a Supreme Court case called Ling uh, versus U.S. Forest Service. This is back in the 80s. Uh, government was uh, authorizing the building of a road through a forest that was sacred to Native Americans. Uh, they sued under the free exercise clause because <clears throat> RIFRA didn't exist. Uh, and they lost. And a lot of the questions that oral argument were, you know, what, is, what does Ling mean for this case? And there's a couple ways you could you could read Ling. You could read Ling as saying, uh, yeah, there's a there's a substantial burden when the government you know builds a road through a forest, uh, 
But that burden doesn't count because the government is just doing something on its own land. That's one. That's how the government tries to, to read Ling. The other way to lead, read Ling is as a as a proto Smith case. And what I mean by that is Employment Division versus Smith said when there's a burden that results from a neutral and generally applicable law, you don't apply strict scrutiny. Uh, and that was what Ling said. Ling said this is an incidental burden. They're not targeting the Native Americans. So even though the burden may be substantial, it doesn't count. And we've argued that second reading of Ling is the proper reading. Uh, it fits with language in Ling itself, talking about the burden is incidental. It also fits with the way that every subsequent Supreme Court case has talked about Ling. Smith talked about Ling as a case about uh, a neutral and generally applicable government action. <clears throat> Trinity Lutheran talked about Ling that way. Fulton talked about Ling that way. And multiple lower courts have talked about Ling that way. Uh, a really interesting example is a Third Circuit case called Tenafly. Uh, that was where Orthodox Jews wanted to uh, put up rubber strips on public utility poles to make a, an Arab, which allows them to carry objects during the Sabbath. So they're trying to use government property for their religious exercise. The government said no. It didn't penalize them. It didn't you know, deny benefits. It just said, we're going to take down the rubber strips that make your Arab. Uh, and we're allowed to do that under Ling. And the Third Circuit said, no, that's the wrong reading of Ling. Ling was about neutral and generally applicable government laws, uh, but it would be a burden to take this down and you're targeting the Jews. So that's a substantial burden and you get to strict scrutiny. Uh, so that's the, that's the Ling issue that came up at oral argument. Uh, the second big issue that came up, uh, Judge, uh, Judge Van Dyke raised this issue several times is like, well, if the government's use of its own land could constitute a substantial burden and, and get you to strict scrutiny under RIFRA, well, that's that's scary. You know, anybody can claim that, you know, if if you don't let me build a church on government land or if you use government land a certain way, that's offensive to me or that's going to you know cause me to go to hell. And there's there's no stopping point. So we have to find some way to to limit the burdens that count under RIFRA. Uh, but I think this this line of objection uh, confuses two very different concepts. So when you're talking about burdens under the Free Exercise Clause or RIFRA, um, the burden is not the spiritual consequences to the, to the plaintiff or the believer of not doing the religious exercise. So if you take like the Amish and Yoder, the burden is not, you know, my child will be harmed if I send my child, spiritually harmed if she goes to public school. Uh, or if you take the Sabbatarian cases, it's not, uh, the burden is, I will go to hell if I don't keep the Sabbath. Uh, those are the spiritual consequences. But the burden is the difficulty that the government puts in the way of that religious exercise. So in uh, in Yoder, for example, it was the fines, the threat of criminal fines if you don't send your children to public schools. Or in Sherbert, uh, the Sabbatarian case, it was the loss of government benefits that you can't get if you keep the Sabbath. And so the burden in, the, in these cases has to be some government action that objectively interferes with religious exercise. So if you take our sacred site case, you know, if the government were to fine the Apaches for going to the sacred site, obvious substantial burden, objective interference with their religious exercise. If they were to physically restrain the Apaches, arrest them uh, to prevent them from going on to Oak Flat, obvious substantial burden. And similarly, by blowing Oak, Oak Flat up and swallowing it in a crater so they can never go there again, that as well as an objective burden on their religious exercise. And I think uh, Judge Van Dyke's tendency to want to treat the spiritual consequences as the burden, um, that creates very significant problems for religious liberty because it means the government, the courts, they either have to uh, wade into religious questions and answer a religious question and second guess the religious believer on the scope of their religious beliefs, or the courts either have to just lay down and, and let the take the plaintiff at their word and anything they say counts as a burden, which is, which is a very extreme position. And then the courts will feel compelled to like carve out different areas that, that can't qualify as a substantial burden. You know, here it's, it's the government's use of land, but in future cases, there's all kinds of things that, that people would want to carve out. Like, you know, if uh, if an action might cause third party harms, if a religious claim might cause third party harms, let's carve that out. And it's ultimately going to harm religious liberty in the long run. Um, but even if you take uh, 
So the government tries to carve out and say, you have to be coercing the person. Uh, the only types of burdens that counter if you're coercing the person. Uh, but that fails on several grounds. Number one, coercion is not in RIFRA's text at all. Uh, coercing the person or burdening the person is not in RIFRA's text at all. It's burdening the exercise of religion. And the case law doesn't bear out this you know, coercion of the person uh, type of rubric. Uh, one of the, the cases that led to RIFRA's enactment was a case called Yang, where the government just conducted an autopsy on a, on a boy who, who died unexpectedly, and the parents objected to that. It wasn't coercing the parents. It wasn't penalizing them. It wasn't even regulating them. It just conducted the autopsy, and yet that seriously interfered with their religious beliefs. Uh, everybody in Congress and the Supreme Court has cited that as an example of a substantial burden. Uh, same with the Arab case, like Tenafly, uh, that was putting up uh, rubber strips on utility poles. Third Circuit said that was a cognizable burden. Uh, even many prison cases don't uh, fit that rubric of coercion, where the prison is just managing its internal operations, deciding what meals to bring in, how to run its cafeteria, yet that can still count as a substantial burden. And even if you say that coercion is the touchstone, uh, we obviously have coercion in the Apache Stronghold case. Coercion simply means the government uses its power to force you to do something you don't want to do or to prevent you from doing something you do want to do. Uh, and here we have coercion in spades. Uh, right now, the Apaches are free to go to Oak Flat, access it, carry out their religious practices there. Uh, but the government is using its power to swallow it in a crater and it's going to stop the Apaches from ever doing that again, uh, even more, more coercively and more convincingly than if they just find the Apaches or imprison the Apaches. So we have plenty of coercion here. Uh, and then a uh, third key issue that came up. Uh, how am I doing on time, Adam? I think we got, I got 10 minutes to start. Yeah, I think you have about like three more minutes if, you, if you'd okay. like. Okay, might, might not get to all four. I can do a fourth one in rebuttal, but... The third issue that, that uh, came up at oral argument was really kind of about the scope of relief. Uh, and Judge Nelson asked a number of questions about this, like, what are we supposed to enjoin here? Let's say you win on substantial burden. What is the appropriate relief? Uh, do we enjoin the, the transfer of the land to the mining company? Uh, do we say that the transfer can go forward, but you can mine it in some less intrusive way? And uh, there's a couple important points to bring out there. Uh, number one is we're just on a preliminary injunction right now. We aren't even at summary judgment. We're not talking about a permanent injunction. All we've asked for is a preliminary injunction. Let's let's preserve the status quo while the while the litigation plays out. Uh, and so the question is not what is the ultimate scope of relief. It's just would enjoining the land transfer temporarily would that preserve the status quo and allow the court to decide the case. The answer is clearly yes. The question about the scope of relief, narrower forms of mining, the, thing, the things that Judge Nelson was bringing up, that's really a question about strict scrutiny. And that's specifically what RIFRA is designed to allow courts to take into account on strict scrutiny. It's are there less restrictive alternatives for accomplishing the government's goals? On the record, as we came before the court uh, two days ago, there's only one proposal. It's in the government's final environmental impact statement. The proposal is mine the entire area of Oak Flat and swallow the entire area in a crater so it can never be done again. Uh, no religious exercise can ever be taken place there again. You know, the government hasn't offered any alternatives to that. So when that's the only alternative on the table, and that's the only purpose of the transfer, it's appropriate to enjoin the transfer. Uh, on remand at the summary judgment stage, permanent injunction stage, the government may come forward with different alternatives it wants to pursue, uh, and they, those may result uh, in a different ruling or a different possible scope of relief, but really all of that gets handled on strict scrutiny, not on the substantial burden prong at the preliminary injunction stage. So that's three out of the four areas that came up. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just, I'll just sum up again. Our core position is just very simple based on the text of RIFRA. What does it mean to substantially burden religious exercise? If finding the Apaches for going to Oak Flat counts, if restraining them from going to Oak Flat counts, uh, 
than blowing Oak Flat to smithereens so they can never go there again and never exercise their religion there again, obviously counts as a substantial burden. Uh, and again, that's that's not a, a broad position. It's a narrow position because all it means is we get to the step second step of the analysis, the strict scrutiny analysis. And, and if the court has really, if the government has really important reasons for carrying out the mine or things like that, it can try to demonstrate that on strict scrutiny. The court can engage in that balancing. And that's exactly how RIFRA is designed to operate. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Mr. Goodrich. Uh, Mr. Ferrati. Well, uh, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, it's good to be with you today. And uh, it's good to be with Mr. Goodrich. Um, he, he did a, a great job on behalf of his clients at the Ninth Circuit. Um, uh, but I do ha have a few differing views on that, as you might assume, in a Federalist Society discussion. Uh, and, and the first one that I, that I want to note is uh, we heard regularly that the land will be destroyed. Uh, and, and I think that the court heard very clearly when Mr. DeBold stood before them that that that's not going to occur. It's not going to be a giant crater. Uh, the, the first issue is certainly um, that anything that goes on is going to be decades in advance. This is the third largest copper deposit in the world. Um, some of it may not be accessible and, and other parts may. But the one thing that the that the mining company has already committed to is the campground, the, a, a particular sacred area of the land um, will remain. But more importantly, part of this whole transfer was actually a trade of land. So the, the Congress, when they actually passed the act to transfer the land, actually received in trade a number of other sacred holy sites uh, within the same area in Arizona. And so I think that those are important elements that some of those decisions were weighed even before this case even came to be, and frankly, even long before uh, this case was ever filed. So um, uh, Mr. Goodrich talked about clear text, uh, precedent, and substantial burden uh, are on his side. Uh, frankly, I, I view them very opposite, um, as, as you might presume. So. Um, Let's look at the ref at RIFRA's legislative history. Um, the House Committee, the Judiciary Report came out, and it says very clearly, the committee's expectation is that the courts will look to free exercise religion cases decided prior to Smith for guidance in determining whether or not religious exercise has been burdened and the least restrictive means have been employed uh, furthering a compelling government interest. Uh, the footnotes of that House Committee report included mention directly of Ling. Uh, the Senate committee report, uh, pre-Smith case law makes it clear that strict scrutiny does not apply to government actions involving only management of internal government affairs or the use of government's own property or resources. That's the Senate committee report with a footnote again to Ling. And so what does, what does Ling do? So Ling was a situation, and, and first of all, uh, you know, we, we started with Bowen prior to Ling, but Ling was a successor to Bowen. And, and what Bowen said is that that there was a, a family who did not want their child to have a social security number. Uh, that was a concern for uh, them. And they believed that adding, you know, identifying their child by a number uh, would really impact that child's uh, ability to go to heaven. And um, uh, the court said, this is, this is the government's internal accounting system. We can't just create a carve out system for uh, any particular group uh, and, and upheld the government's right to issue social security numbers uh, in their system. Uh, Ling was about destruction of land. In fact, Mr. Goodrich uh, and Ms. Barclay said at argument that, if, um, that Ling did not involve destruction of land. Um, quite candidly, I, I beg to differ by looking at the briefs in, in Navajo Nation, which we'll discuss in a little bit. Um, the brief of the Navajo Nation, their, their joint opening brief, they said very clearly, it will destroy Hopi culture and everything that they are as a people because the peaks are sacred and powerful and give the Hopi life. In Ling, again, uh, this was in the brief of respondents. The study concludes that intrusions on the sanctity of the Blue Creek High Country are potentially destructive to the very core of the Northwest Indian religious beliefs and practices. So to identify Ling or Navajo Nation as not complete destruction, I think, I think belies the actual arguments of, of the tribes in Ling and Navajo Nation. 
The other thing to, to contemplate when we're dealing with RIFRA and, and Ling analysis uh, is, is what um, Ms. Professor Stephanie Barclay said. She, she argued on behalf of uh, Amiki uh, in this case. She's also been involved with Beckett in the past. Um, she actually said in, in, a, um, in a law review article uh, just last year that a reconceptualized approach would be necessary um, to prove a prima facie substantial burden much more easily. Uh, I think that there was, a, I mean, there's very clear recognition, and that's at, at page 1343 of her, of her article, but there's a recognition that, that Ling and Bowen and Navajo Nation and Snoqualmie really need to be overturned in order to get to the heart of what it is that they're trying to accomplish in Apache Stronghold. Also be clear that this is not the only one of these cases going through there. There's another case that was tried before the Ninth Circuit and is currently on uh, cert to the Supreme Court seeking, uh, seeking review on these very same issues, uh, I believe led by Professor Barclay uh, in that one. So what are we really dealing with? And I, and I think that um, uh, what we heard, I think, in the argument was Arlupa or RIFRA, we, we, they, there's a preference for uh, the Arlupa type structure when we're dealing with RIFRA cases. But that's a little difficult given the existing case law. Uh, another thing that I do want to mention uh, as we're talking about circuit courts, um, there's very clear law on, on this. Um, Wilson versus Block, Prater versus City of Burnside, Kentucky, Lockhart versus Knopf. There, there's a number of cases as well I can cite um, showing the circuit examples um, that, that do bear out in favor of, um, of this mine going forward. Now, I do want to talk um, briefly before I talk about the judges uh, in conclusion. Um, I want to talk about the tribal law because Judge Gould um, talked at length, or, or I guess he didn't speak at length, but he asked at length, he asked multiple parties um, to talk about the treaty and whether or not the treaty um, had some uh, semblance or standalone could actually answer the questions here. And I think that the answer is no. Um, I think, first of all, that the plaintiffs in this case uh, misunderstand the McGirt principles, as, you, as many of the viewers know, I've been involved in uh, the McGirt issues and, and teleforums on, on that in the past. Um, but let me read to you directly from Article 9 of the Treaty of 1852. It says, relying uh, confidently upon the justice and liberty of the aforesaid government and anxious to remove every possible cause that might disturb their peace and quiet, it is agreed by the aforesaid Apaches that the government of the United States shall at its earliest convenience designate, settle, and adjust their territorial boundaries and pass and execute in their territory such laws as may be deemed conducive to the prosperity and happiness of said Indians. So when we're looking at tribal arguments and when we're looking particularly at treaties, um, Cougar Den is perhaps the, the most recent uh, decision to say this, but it's a longstanding principle. The treaties are to be viewed in the light most favorably to the tribe that signed the agreement. Um, but the problem here is that we don't have a Cougar Den or a Herrera versus Wyoming example of a treaty. Uh, in those examples, for example, on Cougar Den, it, it said very clearly that uh, the Yakima tribe would have the ability to travel on the, on the highways and roads outside of the reservation. Um, that was an issue over fuel. Can they carry fuel or can they just travel on the roads? And, and the Supreme Court said, no, they can carry fuel onto the reservation as well. In Herrera, it was a question about um, hunting the buffalo uh, in the area. And um, in that case, uh, the tribe won successfully because they hunted the, the buffalo in Wyoming land. And, and there was an attempt to assess a fine against the, the tribal members uh, for harvesting, I believe it was elk in that situation. But here we have a very generic, very vague type of explanation. Um, there, there, there is nothing in here to specific, provide any specificity to where that exists. And, and so that's, that's the first point I wanna raise uh, about that in regard to, to the land. But the more specific one that I wanna raise about the land is this land is not held in trust for any tribe. Uh, this land has uh, is not held in trust 
period. This is owned directly in fee, uh, transferred by the Mexican government in 1848. Now, if I were to go down to the federal courthouse uh, here in Oklahoma City and take a knee every day, and I say that this is where I'm, God tells me that I must pray every day, I don't have a right to that land. I don't, it's not being held in trust or being, or being protected for me in any way. Uh, I, I don't have any possessory interest in it. It's just where I go to pray. And there may be some sort of an argument to be made if the tribe, A, the land had been held in trust, they certainly would in that situation. But if there was something more in the treaty um, that can be argued in the language of the treaty, they may actually have that benefit, but they don't. And, and so given the elements that, that are involved in dealing with the tribal law elements um, in this, the very significant and very weighty decisions uh, under Ling and Bowen and Navajo Nation uh, and Snoqualmie, uh, frankly, and, and in Snoqualmie, they, FERC had even used a more favorable standard of, rev of review than they should have. And um, in that instance, it was unsuccessful as well. Um, given these very weighty perspectives, I, I have difficulty finding uh, any real basis, uh, not only for a temporary injunction, but, but for this case, period. Um, I, I think some of the discussion from the judges as we went through this, Judge Ryan Nelson, um, as Luke mentioned, uh, spoke very lengthy trying to figure this out, but did note near the, near the end that um, he, was, he was struggling with the arguments that were being uh, provided on behalf of Apache Nation um, and, or Apache Stronghold and, uh, and was, was really going to have to contemplate them significantly. Uh, Judge Lawrence Van Dyke, uh, he and Judge Nelson, frankly, were the two that I was watching for in particular before arguments. And um, I, I think both of them had quite a significant amount of doubt as to um, the, the merits of the cause, the merits of the temporary injunction, and uh, were struggling with it. And I, I mentioned uh, Judge Gould, uh, Judge Bea, uh, who was on the three judge panel that decided this matter, uh, also chimed in with some questions, but um, also stayed, stayed a little bit uh, less active, obviously, than, than some of the others. Um, and, and Judge Berzon uh, was there. Um, you know, I, she had written a very strong dissent in the past on this, and um, I, I think uh, was following this very, very curiously. Um, so with that, I think that that is what I will um, pause on at this point and uh, hand it back over to Luke. Thank Great. you, Mr. Parati. And uh, sorry, Mr. Goodrich. Thanks, AJ. Oh, uh, responding first, um, one of your first arguments was basically fighting the facts, saying the land won't be destroyed or might not be destroyed or it might be decades away or the campground is going to remain. I, I would just say on this record, there's there's only one description of what is planned for this land, and it's in the final environmental impact statement. And over 180 times, the final environmental impact statement says the destruction in this case will be irreversible, irreversible, irretrievable, permanent, repeatedly says it will happen immediately, uh, says that access to the entirety of Oak Flat uh, will be eliminated. Uh, and the point about the campground, the campground is just about, it's a few acres. It's about 1% of the area of Oak Flat that the plaintiffs use for their religious exercises. And uh, resolution has said, oh, we'll, we'll keep access to the campground until we, Resolution, Copper, decide in our discretion, sole discretion, that it's not safe to do that anymore because of operation of the mine. So basically the only question of access here is we might get access to 1% of Oak Flat temporarily until the mine decides we shouldn't have it anymore. But 99% is guaranteed to be cut off access immediately and completely destroyed. Uh, and that's just the undisputed facts from the final environmental impact statement. Um, I mentioned four, four areas of contention at the argument. I only covered three. So briefly, the fourth one, very interesting issue, not even specific to RIFRA, but it's about when can one statute of Congress displace another one? And Judge Collins brought this up several times saying, you know, RIFRA was enacted in 1993. Uh, this land transfer statute was enacted later. Does the later statute trump the former statute? Uh, 
Textually, RIFRA already addresses this. RIFRA says it applies to later enacted laws unless the later enacted law expressly exempts itself from RIFRA's application by referencing RIFRA. And nobody here disputes that the land transfer statute doesn't do that. So by its text, RIFRA still controls here. Uh, so there'd have to be an argument that somehow RIFRA's express reverence provision is unconstitutional. Um, there's no cases that is that has ever hold that, held that. Uh, Judge Collins brought up one case from the 1950s from the Supreme Court called Marcello, and it's addressing uh, APA, the Administrative Procedure Act, which has a, a kind of similar express reference provision. <clears throat> it says the APA that later enacted laws can't supersede the procedures in the APA, quote, except to the extent that it does so expressly, unquote. And then in Marcello, you had the INA, the Immigration and Naturalization Act. And the INA said, quote, the procedure in here, here and in prescribed, shall be the sole and exclusive procedure for determining the deportability of aliens. And what the Supreme Court said in Marcello was the APA, set, or the INA, satisfied the APA's express reference provision by saying these are the express procedures, the only procedures that govern uh, aliens. And, and so the Supreme Court didn't say the express reference provision is unconstitutional. It said the express reference provision is satisfied. Uh, but nobody has even argued that the express reference provision of RIFRA is satisfied here. Uh, and you actually have two Supreme Court cases that have, that have expressly applied RIFRA to the later enacted uh, Affordable Care Act. Uh, so that's that's a very I, I think that's kind of a side issue, uh, but if it got traction, uh, it would actually be devastating to religious liberty and to RIFRA. It would open up an entire new field of undermining RIFRA by arguing that any time a later enacted statute uh, threatens religious freedom, that later enacted statute trumps RIFRA. Uh, that would be a an utter shock to Congress. Just take one example: the Respect for Marriage Act that was passed very recently. Much of the debate in Congress, like you got through the Respect for Marriage Act because everybody said, oh, that's going to be subject to RIFRA, religious liberty is taken care of. Uh, but if this argument gains traction, all that goes out the window. Uh, and everybody who's trying to force people to participate in same sex marriage can say the Respect for Marriage Act trumps RIFRA. Uh, so that was the that was the fourth issue. I think to, to wrap up, uh, I think what what animates uh, the government's position here, and I've heard it a bit from, from AJ, uh, it's not really the text of RIFRA and substantial burden, how it's applied in our lupa. I mean, I'd be interested if, if AJ differs, but if you actually just look at the plain meaning of substantial burden and ask, does it substantially burden the Apache's religious exercise to blow up their sacred site and stop their religious exercise forever? Is that a substantial burden on their religious exercise? And the answer is obviously yes. So the, the government's position here is not driven by text. Uh, it's not even driven by precedent because Ling, Ling is distinguishable and it was actually addressing a different legal question under the free exercise. What's really driving and animating here is a, is a policy argument. It's if we apply RIFRA according to its text, it, it's gonna have, we're afraid of the consequences. It might unduly restrict the government in managing its own land. Uh, that's a policy argument uh, that is, is commonly expressed, uh, but it's also the policy argument that uh, the Supreme Court made in Employment Division versus Smith, saying if we apply strict scrutiny to all types of federal government action, it's just going to unleash chaos and government can't function uh, if we do that. That policy argument in Smith, that's the exact policy argument that Congress rejected in enacting RIFRA. <clears throat> And that policy argument uh, also uh, doesn't make sense when applied to federal land for several reasons. I mean, number one, federal land, got federal decisions about federal land are already subject to the First Amendment in multiple respects. You just take public forum doctrine under the free speech clause. The government manages federal land if it said we'll allow protests, some protests here, but not others. That would clearly violate the First Amendment uh, under forum doctrine. If the government just transferred the land, said, let's give it to a church and tell them to put up a church and promote Christianity. Uh, that would clearly violate the Establishment Clause, even under the most originalist interpretation of the Establishment Clause. And that's how the government funded the established church, was 
transferring land to the established church to put up churches and to fund the ministry. Um, but even setting aside the First Amendment, government land and government decisions about land are subject to a plethora of environmental laws, uh, NEPA, FLIPMA, NHPA, NAGPRA, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and on and on. Uh, just to give one example, the Endangered Species Act. If the government wanted to do the exact same mine here at Oak Flat, but there was a, an endangered snail darter that would be rendered extinct, we all know the government could not execute the mine. That's the TVA case. Uh, and in that case, the government wouldn't even get a chance to satisfy strict scrutiny. The Endangered Species Act doesn't give the government a strict scrutiny affirmative defense. So really all we're doing here, if you apply RIFRA according to its text, all we're doing here is giving the fundamental right of religious freedom a little bit less protection than we already give to endangered animals. And that is not at all an extreme position or a position under which the government can't function. You know, Congress said you can apply strict scrutiny. We have 30 years of experience under RIFRA and it's proven to be a workable test. So I guess to sum up, I mean, if, AJ, maybe during your time, the three things I'd love to hear is, number one, can you really square the government's position with just a plain meaning interpretation of substantial burden? I don't think you can do that. Number two, you know, that the whole prison analogy, um, you know, there's a case where Justice Gorsuch, then Judge Gorsuch, said that a convicted criminal in prison had to be given access to a sweat lodge. So how do you, how does it, how does it make sense that convicted criminals in prison, in a high security prison, have more freedom to access a sweat lodge on the federal land of prison uh, than law abiding Apaches have to exercise their religion using a sweat lodge at Oak Flat? How does that make sense? Uh, and then the third question would be like, why should endangered animals get far more protection than law abiding human beings seeking to exercise their fundamental First Amendment right of religious freedom uh, just because it's on government land. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodrich and AJ. Yeah, thank you. I, I think I can uh, generically sum up the last two points um, by, by just simply saying this. This is the government's land. It has been since 1848 when they received it from Mexico. Uh, the constitution allows them to dispose of their land as they see fit. And here they're trying to do that. Um, I, again, I, I can't claim, I mean, there, there, there's no claim of adverse possession. There's just simply a claim like as I was a kid, when I would go play on somebody's yard, I'd go play baseball. I didn't own the land. I just played it for baseball. I didn't have a right to it. I didn't have a right to use it. Uh, I just did it until the landowner told us quit playing on my field. So I, I think that that's really part of the situation that we're dealing with here is this is the government's land. The government doesn't want it to be their land anymore. It's going to transfer it uh, for a very significant national security purpose. Um, so as far as endangered animals, uh, you know, the darter snail was actually a, a, in Memphis rather than, than Arizona. Um, but there's been no evidence or claim that there's an endangered animal here at, at Oak Flat. Um, but more importantly, again, it, it's the simple issue that um, while it may be used by individual parties, it doesn't have any ownership interest that belongs to those individual parties. Um, and, and so I just think that that's the that's the difficult answer. Um, square plane meaning we, we have we have very clear examples within the text that they are applying Yoder. They're applying, um, I'm sorry, not Schulteis, but um, they're applying those other examples that, that really come through in the decision um, of which Ling is a part of that process and element. And so that's what we're dealing with within RIFRA. Um, and, and I think that it's very clear that uh, not only from, from the text of RIFRA, uh, I think from looking at this in a plain practical way that you have individuals trying to use somebody else's land and then getting upset when it's their turn to sell it. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Ferrati. Um, it's uh, been a great debate. Uh, let me turn to our questions here. Um, first is, what, if any, significance is there to the U.S. government delivering the land to a private party for development? Sure, I can address that. <clears throat> 
that question came up at oral argument to the federal government uh, with the court asking the federal government attorney, what difference does it make that there's a transfer to a private party? Uh, what if the government just kept the land and implemented the mine itself and destroyed Oak Flat? Would that change your position? Uh, and the government said, no, it wouldn't change our position. Whether we transfer it to a private entity or the government carries out the destruction itself, it just doesn't count as a substantial burden. Uh, to AJ's point about uh, playing baseball in somebody else's yard, uh, it, there, nobody disputes that this was Apache land uh, originally. Uh, the 1852 treaty, the government promised to respect the Apache way of life on Apache land. Uh, the earliest maps from the Smithsonian show this as Apache land uh, and uh, government destroying it is inconsistent with the treaty. Uh, but even today, as we sit here today, the Apaches have gone on to Oak Flat for many years uh, continuously since the 1800s uh, and long before to engage in their religious exercise. There's a, a, an, an executive order, 13007, that requires the government to preserve access and uh, the physical integrity of Native American sacred sites. Uh, and that's been held to be incorporated in FLTMA, the Federal Land Policy Management Act. So the Apaches aren't like going to play in somebody else's neighbor's yard. Everybody recognizes this was their land. It was taken from them by the federal government. And the federal government is currently obligated to preserve their access to that land. And it's hereby taking that access away. Um, great. Any, any res response, Mr. Friday, from those points? Could, could you restate the question for me again, please? Uh, the question was whether it matters, what the significance is that the U.S. government is delivering it to a private party for development, as I guess in contrast if the U.S. government was developing it itself or something. Okay, uh, well, that, that last part is, I, I think, helpful. So, so if, the, if the federal government was uh, developing the land themselves, obviously that there would be a, a very significant and, and different approach to it, but, but they're not. The United States government isn't in the business of mining for copper. Uh, I would probably be fairly, you know, there's a lot of economic arguments I could probably make for why they should not, um, not try to do that but they're choosing not to, right? Under the constitution, they have the ability to dispose of their land. And, and again, uh, Mr. Goodrich uh, uh, cites it as Apache land. I, again, the land transfer from Mexico is directly to the United States. It's held in fee patent by the United States. There, there is no evidence uh, that it's being held in trust or any other basis on behalf of the Apaches. So certainly if, if they want to develop that argument at the next step, and I, I have no doubt there's going to be a next step, whoever wins, um, that's something that they may want to do because uh, as it stands now, there is no evidence uh, in this basis that this is Apache land. This is the United States land. Um, it, they have the right under the constitution to dispose of their land. And here they're intending to do that uh, with the intent of actually gaining other land with other sacred tribal um, protections that the government wants to place upon those. I think, oh, go ahead. I'd, I'd be interested. So nobody disagrees that the government can dispose of federal land, uh, but there are cases saying it has to do so subject to other provisions of the constitution, subject to other federal laws. So just to take one example, if the federal government here uh, gave the land to a Christian community and said, we want you to promote Christianity at Oak Flat. Please build a church and promote Christianity. That's the condition on which we're giving you the land. Number one, would that violate the Establishment Clause? I think so. And then number two, if the government said, hey, we don't like the pagan religious practices that the Apaches engage in in Oak Flat. We think those are harmful to society. So we're going to sell the land to the highest bidder on the condition, express condition that they destroy all the sacred sites at Oak Flat, you must destroy and desecrate them, and you must prevent the Apaches from ever entering the land again. We're gonna sell it to you for that reason. Would that violate the Establishment Clause? I mean, I think both the answers are yes. And the, the basic position we're, we're taking here is that, yes, the government can sell land, but it, it does so subject to the First Amendment, subject to RIFRA, subject to other statutes that regulate the way it does that. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, look, I, I think there may even be an establishment clause as is, right? If, if the government can't transfer this land uh, but for 
um, one individual organization's religious liberty claims. We, we may actually have an establishment clause as is at this point. So um, just worth considering. Um, well, the Supreme Court already addressed or rejected that argument, but can you speak to, like, do you agree or disagree that it would violate the establishment clause to say, we're, we want, we're giving you this land so you can erect a church and promote Christianity, or we're giving you this land because we hate the Apaches' religious exercise and we want you to dest destroy their site and keep them out? Would that, in your view, violate or not violate the establishment clause and the free exercise clause? I think to try to uh, bootstrap in an example and say that um, the uh, Resolution Copper folks hate the Apache stronghold folks, I think that that's inappropriate uh, for the conversation. But um, yeah, I'll just stop there. But it, it, it's a hypothetical just designed to isolate our federal land transfers. Are they ever, ever subject to the First Amendment? So it's, it's a yes or no, I'm not saying Resolution Copper hates anybody. It's a, it's a hypothetical. So is it a, a yes violate the first establishment in free exercise or no, it doesn't? Well, and, and, I, and I suppose I'll even uh, respond. I'm, I'm happy to answer if, if you will answer the simple question of who owns this land. If you were to go look for title of this land, who owns this land? Uh, federal government owns it, yeah. according to the federal government. So I've answered that. Now you'll answer. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, we don't have that situation here, and I'm not necessarily concerned with uh, well, the federal government trying to not, not dodge. I'm about it. to. Yes I'm trying no, to violate violate I'm the establishment to. clause and the exercise clause. No, I, I'm trying to. And, and the simple answer is we don't have that situation here. But if there was actual evidence, if there was material evidence of that, yeah, there probably is a pretty significant establishment clause issue. Oh, really interesting back and forth. Um, so uh, Alan Rein Reinach asks, the Supreme Court's ruling upholding the treaty, I think the treaty was there at Oklahoma two years ago. I think he's referencing McGirt. Does McGirt have any relevance here? I think it'd probably be more on the trust side of things, but does McGirt have any relevance to this case? I, I would say McGirt only has relevance um, if this land had been held in trust for the tribes uh, or if, I mean, under, under the, the federal statutes on, on what is a reservation, uh, if it's a reservation, if it's a dependent community, which this is not a dependent community, um, I see no evidence that this is a reservation um, and, and there's one other example that, that I'm, I'm not recalling right now, but none of those elements of, of um, tribal lands of Indian country apply to this situation. And that's, that's the reason I don't think McGirt, um, McGirt makes sense to uh, connect here. Yeah, I, <clears throat> and just remind people can send in more questions using the chat feature. I think that's right, right, Adam. Um, McGirt's relevant here. There's, that's there's other... There's other treaty cases, uh, Menominee, Mitchell, where the Supreme Court has looked at fairly general language in a treaty, like these lands are to be held as Indian lands are held, or these lands should be managed, quote, for the needs and best interests of the Indians, unquote, and held that that gives rise to a treaty or a trust obligation. So the argument here is the, the treaty says that the government will settle the territorial boundaries of the Apaches and pass laws, quote, conducive to their prosperity and happiness in their territory. And the argument is nobody disputes that this was Apache territory at the time of the treaty. It was identified as such in U.S. government maps and that transferring it for destruction uh, goes against that obligation to legislate for their prosperity and happiness. You know, if, if that's the if that's where we're going with that basis, um, but prior to McGirt, what we had was a situation where we had the Solemn analysis. You had about 15 different elements. None was more important than the other, but they would look at this amorphous thing and decide whether or not land was tribal land or not. Um, Mr. Goodrich may have had an argument under the Solemn analysis, but what McGirt did was say one thing, and it, it seems to be where we're going with, with tribal law claims now is, Show me the words, show me the words of establishment, show me the words of disestablishment, show me the words of diminishment, show me those, the actual specific item. And in this case thus far, that hasn't been shown. Uh, great, we have a few more minutes. I don't see another question in the chat. I did have kind of a uh, two sides of the coin sort of question. So I'm wondering um, to Mr. Goodrich, why does the lesser include the greater? So we know that the pre-Smith case law, penalty or fine, 
Um, we know that that is a violation of substantial burden. But here it's a you know it's a sale to a private party. It's a com- or a complete destruction of the of the land. It's not really a penalty or a fine in that pre Smith um, Yoder. Um, and I forget the other case. Um, it's not really a penalty or fine in that context. So why would the lesser we you know include the greater? And then the other is um, to Mr. Ferrati on the other side of this is if a substantial burden means a fine or a penalty, then why would complete destruction not be covered? I I, I feel like there was some reference to legislative history um, and maybe some precedent, but substantial burden if if a penalty or a fine is a substantial burden, why would you know, why would the greater not be covered? Why would it not? Why would a uh, complete destruction not be covered? A great question. Judge Sutton addressed that exact question in a case called Height uh, in the prisoner context and said, yeah, if you are uh, punishing a prisoner for engaging in religious exercise, like putting him in sol- solitary confinement, or if you're taking away benefits from a prisoner because of his r- religious exercise, that's that's Sherbert and Yoder, that that counts as a substantial burden. Uh, but then he said, if you're just preventing the religious exercise, using your control over the prison facility and preventing the religious exercise, that is even more obviously a substantial burden uh, because he even used that word, the lesser includes the greater. <laughs> and I think it includes that uh, as a matter of of basic logic you're asking about and text, substantial burden. Uh, burden is in what way is the government making you worse off than you were before? Uh, when the government puts you to a choice of either giving up your religious exercise or suffering a penalty or a fine, it's making you worse off, it's burdening you. Uh, but if the government prevents you, uses its power and control to completely prevent you, doesn't even give you the choice of suffering the penalty or the fine, it's burdened you in an even more significant way. Uh, that's the plain textual argument, and there are multiple cases that agree with it. Mr. Ferrati? Yeah, and, and my answer uh, to you, Adam, to your, to your question is, is very simple. Ling, Bowen, Navajo Nation, and Snoqualmie. Uh, each of these cases lays out explicitly that that's, that's the test. I'm relying on what the law says on, on this as a, as a short answer. And it really comes down to coercion, as, as uh, Mr. Goodrich said a little bit ago. In these cases, they, they, there is a belief that there is no coercion here. Um, I know that Mr. Goodrich disagrees with that, and he stated so at the Ninth Circuit. Um, but the case law says that this is how we analyze it. And Stephanie Barclay made very clear that it's going to require uh, a review or a relook at um, a reconceptualized look to prove a prima facie case of substantial burden more easily. That's where we are. Uh, that's where we are, is, is even folks supporting Mr. Goodrich's argument uh, recognize where we are in the case law. And so in order for Mr. Goodrich to succeed, the Ninth Circuit is going to have to overturn Navajo Nation. They're going to have to overturn Snoqualmie. And uh, then the Supreme Court is going to have to reassess Ling and Bowen. That, that's where we are at the end of the day with this case. Uh, great. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you to both of our excellent speakers. This has been a fantastic debate. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jack for closing, uh, closing words. And um, I appreciate so much all of your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you as well, Adam, uh, for helping moderate today and then to Luke and AJ for their valuable time and expertise in what was a really interesting discussion, I'm sure, for everybody. Um, As always, we do welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. As always, please keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming programs. We've got a lot lined up for next week, so please be on the lookout. Um, And with that, thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned.